Gregor Neuert, who is an uh, assistant professor in molecular physiology and biophysics, biomedical engineering, and pharmacology at Vanderbilt University. And Gregor actually did his uh, undergrad degree in solid state physics and then moved for his PhD to biophysics and worked with Hermann Gaub. And then after his PhD, joined the lab of Alexander van Nudenaden at MIT on a DFG fellowship and then joined Vanderbilt and what was immediately was awarded the NIH Director's New Innovator Award and more recently was also awarded a Dean's Faculty Fellow position at Vanderbilt. So um, very excited to hear from you, Gary Gregor, about your update for new work. I think you're still muted. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, we can hear you now and we can see okay, your screen, great. Um, thank you very much, um, Alexander, for the very kind introduction. Um, and also um, for the opportunity to present my work today, I also like to thank Amy for setting up the stage for the MAP kinases uh, through this exciting talk. And today I will talk about a recent study that was done entirely by a graduate student, a former graduate student of mine who is now uh, postdoc, um, and he did all the experiment, he developed all the computational analysis um, and also the intellectual framework. And so the question we are asking is, how do kinetic environments of automatic stress regulate cell fates and cell survival? Um, and so we all know that setting pathways have an important function in measuring and detecting different signals and depending on what are these signals is and what which pathways are activated, several responses can happen in the cells that then enables the cell to either survive or try to um, start mitigation approaches to survive or respond differently to these environments. And basically everything we know in cell signaling comes from experiments in which we do careful changes of acute environmental changes. And this could be hormone stresses, signaling molecules or drugs. And then we assay signaling pathways with different assays and quantify activity. But if we actually look in a more physiological context, and for example, here the um, example of development, we know that embryos, for example, in a larvae have uh, anterior posterior sites where there are morphogen gradients that can change from one side to the other side. But if this embryo actually develops as it normally does, these uh, morphogen gradients don't actually stay constant in time, but they actually change over time. And this means that, for example, a specific cell on this side will change over, will experience over time a morphogen gradient that does change, but most likely doesn't change acutely, but more gradually over time. And depending on where the cell in this embryo is, this temporal dynamics can be actually quite different. Another example are cells in the kidney, which are constantly exposed to osmolarity gradients that go from normal osmolarity to several orders, um, several fold higher osmolarity, depending on where these cells are in the cortex. And if you look at the stationary cells and we um, plot osmolarity gradient in different directions within this kidney, then these cells can either um, see a constant um, osmolite stress or a gradual stress or slowly uh, increasing stress. But if there's, for example, immune cells that invade uh, the kidney due to injury, then these immune cells migrate. And depending on which direction they migrate, they may have a constant osmolarity exposure, a rapidly increasing osmolarity exposure or a slowly increasing osmolarity change. But very rarely would they have an acute change in the osmolarity concentration. And so we believe that 
considering these temporal gradients in the environment to understand cells and cell signaling is very important. And so fundamental question in my lab is if we compare physiology to cell culture and we compare these different environmental changes, is there something fundamentally different in cell signaling that we do not capture currently with cell culture experiments because we perform these acute experiments? And on a more broader scale, if you look at all biological uh, phenotypes in cells, most of the experiments we do are in this purple plane where we may change the genetics, we make mutant as we have seen in the previous talk, or we change different types of molecules as we also have seen in the previous talk, but we very rarely change actually this gradual treatment. And the real human cells in the body and in the disease phenotypes are actually have to deal with this temporal gradients. And right now there is this tremendous gap in knowledge that we have. And I believe that if we consider this gradual treatment, we will discover new phenotypes as we have actually done so in yeast and in human cells. Uh, we may also then can come up with uh, new drugs um, as well as maybe better treatments in the future. And so because this is such a, a new dimension that has not been really explored at all, we wanted to start with simple experiments uh, that are very well controlled. And so we take immune cells, and I will elaborate a little bit more which type of cells these are, and we either expose them to a step or a ramp treatment. And in both cases, the final concentration of the stress, as well as the total amount of stress, is identical. And the question is, do we observe different phenotypes and what are the underlying mechanisms? And we focus on mainly uh, a T cell cell line, Jurkat cells, or a monocell uh, cell line, THP1 cells. And we focus on immune cells because immune cells are actually found in many different parts in the body and they also um, travel throughout the body through the bloodstream. And we choose this osmolarity example uh, because in the kidney, this is uh, very important to consider as well as in the intestine where cells are, can be exposed to osmolarity gradients. But it has been also shown that osmolarity changes happens in the skin, the eye, or the vertebral discs. And so we develop um, a novel setup in which we have a, a beaker in a cell culture in which these um, cells grow in suspension on a steer plate. And then, then we have a computer programmable pump, which has a high concentration of osmolite. And what we do is we pump in this osmolite over time, and then we take samples out at specific time points um, and we fix them. Or um, if you do microscopy experiments, we can also do a similar setup under microscopy assays. And the advantage of this kind of setup is that we can apply any currently developed methodology for population or single cell assay with this kind of approach. Um, and so what Alexander has done is he has exposed cells, Alexander team in my lab, um, has done um, steps, fast increasing ram ramps, intermediate increasing ramps or slow increasing ramps. And then we measured, he measured viability. And what he found is that if we use a stress of 300 milliosmol NACL in Jurkat cells, that upon acute treatment or fast treatment, most of the cells die around 90%. But if we ramp the osmolite for half for um, 10 hours, then we observed that 40% of the cells actually survive. We also then um, did similar experiments in the THP1 cell line, monocell cell line, and found the same, same um, behavior. And then we also used a different osmolite, manitol, that is not toxic to cell, and also found that we have these a rate dependent behavior. And so we believe that this changes in osmolarity is independent of the cell, cell line as well as of the osmolite type and is a more general cell physiological uh, behavior. So then the next question is what is causing this differential phenotypes that we observed? And previously people have studied kidney cells and they have identified um, natural osmolite uh, betaine, imusitonol, sorbitol, taurine, and urea. Um, but under our experimental condition, we do not find that either in normal media step or ramp condition, there is a significant um, difference in these osmolites. Um, 
And so this made us to ask what is actually going on to drive this viability phenotype. And so we used the flow cytometry assay to look at phosphorylated uh, proteins related to stress signaling, growth, survival, inflammation, DNA damage, apoptosis, and caspase signaling. And these are all well-established um, markers of these processes. And so what we do is we take our cells, we sample them as I uh, previously have um, mentioned, and then we barcode each time point by a combination of two dye specific orange and Pacific blue. Um, we then pool these different time points together then we have all time points in one tube, and then we split the sample in many different tubes, and then either stain with one or two specific antibody out of this list that I mentioned previously. Then we run these um, cells through a flow cytometer, and then we use um, computational demultiplexing to identify each of these time points. Then we plot the histograms of the markers that we measure, and we quantify the cells in a of population, negative population, or positive population for that particular marker. And um, so a data set with here we show four time points, but in reality we may measure actually 12 time points um, over this 10 hour period. And here we measured a uh, cleaved PARP. And what we find is that upon um, step condition, there is a strong induction of PARP activity. Each of these histograms is an individual biological replica experiment. And this shows you that we get extremely good reproducibility between biological replica. And um, we also have very well um, aligned time points. Because these cells um, experience the osmolarity stress differently over time, so the experiments actually then take six hours um, for the step experiments and 10 hours for the ramp experiments. And what we observe is that there's a significant differences in the fractions of cells that are positive for PARP. And if you now replot the data as a function of the commutative exposure, which is the stress over time, then and then we look at the endpoint measurements, we can then ask what is the percentage of cells that are either uh, positive in a step or in a ramp condition. And everything that deviates from um, an equal distance line in the middle basically says that there is differential regulation. And so if you now look at all of these data sets, we find that the caspase signaling group, including um, um, H2AX um, and PARP, are strongly differentially regulated in step versus a ramp condition. We also say, see that P38 is differentially regulated, um, whereas other markers are not as strongly differentially related. And some of these markers are more um, correlating with the um, commutative exposure. So if you now look into this caspase data as a function of time, we see that caspase 3 is differentially regulated over time, caspase 8, um, caspase 9, and as previously shown, caspase uh, PARP um, as well. So we also performed experiments where we expose cells first to the RAM, and then we start measuring um, caspase reactivation and PARP activation and compare that to acute treatment. And the idea here is maybe the longer exposure to the high salt stress causes additional activation. And what we find is that if cells have been treated with a RAM profile and then we, they have been monitored for additional six hours, uh, five hours here, we find that there is no additional activation of these caspases um, compared to acute treatment of cells um, for six hours of step. So this indicates, and also no PARP activation. So this indicates that this differential regulation is truly related to the ramp of change. We also looked at caspase 3 and PARP activation for different steps of um, NACL treatment. And we find that the fraction of positive caspases, caspase 3 and positive CPARP correlates um, with the increase in the osmotic stress in acute treatments. So because we have such um, high reproducible data and high quality data, we can actually look at the timing of caspase activation in this acute treatment. And what we find is um, that caspase 3 gets activated first and then slowly followed uh, or shortly followed later 
by CPARP activation, whereas caspase 8 and caspase 9 get activated much later. So we then also wanted to know if this temporal relationship can be actually observed in single cells. Um, so we co-stained PARP activated uh, caspase 9 and PARP together in the same cells. And what we find is on the beginning, both of them are negative. And then as time progresses, PARP get activated first and then later caspases get activated, indicating that indeed caspase 9 does not activate it, get not activated before PARP activation in single cells. We then wanted to know if this um, caspase activation and the change in, um, in the osmotic stress is really uh, causative. So what we use is caspase inhibitor and we use two different pan caspase inhibitor um, in a step condition. And what we find is that if we inhibit all the caspases, then the cells are able to survive up to 40% in step condition, which is similar to conditions in ramp conditions where caspases are not activated. If we inhibit caspase 8 and caspase 9 independently, we also do not see a rescue in the cell viability. Um, and also we looked for necroptosis with a necrostatin inhibitor and did not see an increase in viability, indicating that we think that this viability phenotype is um, mostly driven by apoptosis. Um, we also showed that if we inhibit caspase with uh, a pan caspase inhibitor, that we do not get caspase um, activation um, at all. And so after we looked at the caspases, we also looked at the P38 activation because this has been reported many times that it's activated up on osmotic stress. And also as um, Amy reported uh, uh, previously, and we also find that, that there is a very quick and transient activation of P38. Um, and here we, um, see that we get a very strong fast increase and then an adaptation back um, to some elevated level. If we induce the P38 using a 10 hour RAM profile, we see that the P38 <sighs> gets slowly activated. We then wanted to know if this P38 activation is also contributing to cell viability and we used a pan caspase inhibitor and then in step condition and then actually ask if the viability increase. And so, also, we saw some um, induction in viability. We do not really get the same kind of um, rescue in the viability that we see in, in ramp condition or in caspase inhibitor condition. And this indicates that under, in these experiments, P38 does not significantly contribute to our cell survival phenotype. We also looked at H2AX as a marker for DNA damage. And we also see that H2AX is differentially regulated in step and ramp condition. And in step condition, if we either inhibit all the caspases or all the P38s, then we also do not see activation um, of DNA damage, indicating that DNA damage is both regulated by caspase and P38. So then we wanted to better understand what is actually going on to help the cell to be protective against this osmotic stress. And we revisited this question about osmo osmolite changes. And so Alexander, so we don't really have mass spectroscopy experience, but we have a very good core um, at Vanderbilt. And Alexander by himself um, set up these experiments um, and together with the core was able to quantify small molecules um, in these cells. And we looked at a whole range of small molecules and rank them based on their abundance um, relative to the average abundance of all the osmolite, which is the red line here. And what we observe is that amino acids are most abundant in these cells compared to previously reported osmolites, which are at very low abundance. And in, in order for cells to um, respond to osmolarity changes, they have to build up the same level of osmolytes um, inside the cell. And so this means that the absolute concentration of the osmolyte is actually very important. Um, so we then looked into this amino acids in more detail um, under media control condition, step condition, or 10 hour ramp condition. And what we find is that among all these amino acids, proline is strongest induced in step condition 
or change is strongest in, in step condition, and then even change stronger in these ramp condition compared to um, any of the other amino acid. And so this then, so then we look further, is there a relationship between this change in proline and the lack of caspase activation? And then we do a step um, treatment and we compare cells in which uh, we measure protein proline either in fully caspase activated cells or inhibited cas uh, um, caspase cells, we find that there is no difference in proline level, indicating that proline independently of caspases increases in these cells. Alexander then looked in the literature um, to see if there's actually um, data available in mammalian cells up on osmotic stress in, in terms of gene expression. And he did an analysis and found that protein transporter are actually uh, induced in two different independent studies compared to non-stressed conditions. And um, this uh, proline transporter is stronger induced than, for example, proteins that are involved in uh, proline biosynthesis or protein catabolic processes. So this indicates that maybe there's an active transport of proline into the cell going on. And so Alexander performed experiments in, in which he supplements the media with proline or a precursor amino acid glutamine, which can be internally converted into proline. And when he does the step experiments and he grows cells um, in proline, two hour prior to the stress experiment, he finds that the 60 millimolar proline or 60 millimolar glutamine or a combination of both, we gain significant cell viability almost as much as we observed for the REM condition or the um, caspase inhibitor condition. And so this uh, led us to conclude that proline actually protects cells from um, osmotic stress. We also exposed cells to longer periods of proline or glutamine exposure before osmotic stress. And we all only saw a small increase in viability indicating that even the short treatment of um, two hours is sufficient to protect the cells against this um, osmotic stress. And so in summary, we found that upon acute treatment, caspases get strongly activated, which then causes apoptosis, whereas this a slow increase in, of stress to the same final concentration in the same total amount does not activate um, caspases, but um, imports proline that then helps the cells to protect against this um, osmotic stress. And so we believe that using different gradual environmental changes can actually be important to study cell signaling as we have seen for caspases or P38 signaling here in, in human cells. And in yeast cells, we recently reported in uh, PNAS that cells HOC1 actually encodes a, a specific rate threshold um, mechanism that enables the cell to be sensitive not only to the total concentration, but actually to the rate as well. And so we believe if we want to really fully understand cell signaling and cell phenotypes, we have to consider these gradual treatments to really see how cells um, behave in normal physiological condition, because we maybe miss um, this whole dimension here in our understanding of cell signaling. And so on the end, I'd like to thank Alexander who did all the experiment and developed the comp the, all the computational analysis. Um, I also thank other lab members uh, for their support as well as funding sources. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thanks so much, Gregor. That was super interesting. I think it really does emphasize that in many cases, we really don't know what the dynamics of the stimulus is, right, in vivo. Um, and and it, as you point out, it does contain that stimulus dynamics, not just the signaling dynamics, but the stimulus dynamics, the input dynamics play a big role. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Hi, Gregor. Hi. Um, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have done some uh, live cell imaging 
um, or some assay to see whether the early caspase activity, um, I think it was Peter Sober who showed that there can be a great cell-cell variability in the onset time of the very first action of the caspase. Um, do you think that variability itself is also affected by the RAM uh, introduction of the stimulus versus the step-like? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a good question. So we have not done live cell imaging um, on these cells. And um, yeah, I think it's a very interesting question to ask whether gradients actually modulate not only the amplitude of the response, but also the variability of the response. And um, yeah, that's something to look at, definitely, yeah, very Yeah, very which means, we just speculate that maybe the variability will be even greater um, with the ramp. Um, well, I think it's very hard to to stimulate, I don't, I don't know this, this study in detail. So I'm, so the question is what is causing the variability in the first place? So is this because cells are in different cell cycle stages? Um, do they have different overexpression of certain proteins that maybe introduce the variability in the first place? Um, or are these maybe some complexes formed already that are then can be activated quicker than complex that need to be formed first. I think this, like this just comes to my mind if I think about variability under acute condition. I mean, I mean, I could maybe, well, it, I think you can speculate in two ways. You can speculate in this way that um, ramp profile gives the cell more time to respond to the stress. And so there is maybe this maybe reduces variability because it can maybe more equally prepare itself for that. Um, on the other side, it can maybe introduce more variability because the upstream protein that gets activated doesn't get activated as quickly in all the cells, but maybe slowly in different cells. And therefore, this could introduce more variability. Um, right. I mean, I think there are yeah, I think there are many different um, possibilities there. Yeah. Thing for study. <laughs> yeah. I think you've done, Greg, I think you've done some theoretical work, right? Uh, some modeling work on these networks too. And um, is there a sense that the topology of the network, you know, the various feedback mechanisms that just by looking at that, you can uh, develop predictions about whether there is a ramp, whether there's a gradient decoding mechanism or a gradient sensitive mechanism or not? Yes. So, I mean, what we have done is, so we indeed have done modeling studies and I think that, um, but this has been mostly done right now on the yeast pass, HOC1 pathway, which just does mm -hmm. not show a lot of variability in the modeling framework in that system is actually a purely uh, ODE based um, system, which is just describing basically the mean. Um, we also, and so um, I think this modeling framework, I think it is very powerful that we have. Um, and I think we are able to actually look at net different no network topologies. And I think we are also able to make predictions for different mutants in this pathway. But I think we would need to expand that to single cells and then apply that to the data that we can generate right now. I mean, the data that we generate is very rich in dynamics as well as in different markers and that this should enable us in the future to build models and then actually test these questions uh, computationally if there would a ramp uh, would introduce more or less variability in the system. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Gregor. Very interesting. Gregor, can I also can I ask kind of a bigger picture question? Um, I'm curious. So if you think about like physiology, like you know, I think your work really demonstrates how important it is that you know 
to think about ramps versus steps. But in, if you think about physiology, like in the human body, have you thought about what what signals are we are we most likely to be, you know, maybe misrepresenting by studying only with steps? Like, is you know, are things like osmolarity or like metabolite concentrations or like growth factors? What do you think is most likely in let's say in a physiological situation in the body, you know, to be more of a ramp as opposed to like a burst, right? And so we should be really thinking yeah. about studying it using tools like this. Yeah, so I think a, a good example is uh, insulin levels in the body. I mean, that's a well-established, I mean, a lot of the hormone, hormones, I mean, they, there are papers, they are like 30, 40 years old where people have measured over time um, hormone level changes, either in rodents, but even in humans. I mean, there were studies I think they can probably not do today anymore. Um, but I think there is then everything regarding clocks related, this changes over time. Um, and I also think, I mean, the question about drugs, okay, if we administer drugs orally versus intravenously, how is this changing? I mean, some people say, well, we just give maximum level of drug and we just keep it constant. And that's it. And that's, this is what we do in the clinic. I mean, I talk to our pharmacology people, but, but we also know that we have a huge gap between what we can do in cell culture and in animal models and then actually what works in people. Um, and so if we can maybe go in and um, test some of these gradient profiles earlier on to then maybe see if there are drugs that are specific to rates. I mean, I think there's a lot of potential for this. Um, and, and then I think there's a whole, so there's one question is the physiology, physiology aspect, okay? I think stresses is a good example. Growth factors is a good example. Everything that could change. But then also model inference basic biology, even in the yeast. I mean, the fact that we can take a yeast POP1 system, which has been studied for many years and we find a new mechanism that never been reported in any signaling system, means tells you something. And so I think there's huge potential for that. Um, and yeah, I think it's a new dimension from my point of view that we need to look at. Yeah, no, that's great. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. I think that probably concludes. We're on, um, past the 9.30 time point, but uh, thanks so much for some great talks today. 